Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Chess interview series with jazz pianist, composer, and educator Alain Malay. We caught up with him in early 2021 to talk about the COVID-19 world, his latest 2020 CD, A Wake of Sorrows Engulfed in Rage, and his life in music. He was born in France, moved to the States at the age of 21 to attend the Berklee College of Music, where he is now a professor in the ensemble and piano departments. He has toured and recorded with some of the biggest names in jazz and pop, like Phil Woods, Paul Simon, Paquito de Riviera, Mark Johnson, and many others. Get to know him and dig this interview. Thank you for taking a minute out. I really appreciate it. Sure. Jumping in, and we're, I'm going to start off with uh, the new album, Wake of Sorrows and Gulfs and Rage. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, this album, and it's, it's out during a pandemic. Just kind of talk to me a little bit about this project. The, the timing of the release was uh, a little bit in, unfortunate. Uh, it wasn't intended that way, but uh, there was uh, the time when it, when it was supposed to be released um, is right when basically the pandemic was, uh, or the lockdown was about, a, you know, three weeks. Uh, we were about three weeks in the, in, into the lockdown, and uh, then the, the whole George Floyd uh, incident had uh, uh, occurred. And um, so it was unfortunate in the sense that, um, you know, if you are a thoughtful person, which I try to be, uh, you try to keep some perspective on things. It felt a little silly to be going, hey, check out my uh, new record. Uh, at, uh, at the time when the whole country was in serious turmoil uh, yeah. in more ways than one. So um, so I actually sat on it for uh, for about a month. Um, and uh, and then the label was uh, pretty much saying, well, you know, it's, it's out. You got to do something. And uh, I, I thought it over, and then I decided um, I would reach out to the uh, Facebook community uh, and uh, – and promote the record and basically give the uh, the profits of all the downloads, everything that I had control over, basically, um, to Black Lives Matter. That was, uh, you know, I thought it over. Uh, uh, there were plenty of uh, uh, charities that uh, he that that it could have gone to, but the, the you know Black Lives Matter at the time seemed to have. Um, or to enjoy a little bit of momentum, and it's uh, something that is close to my heart for multiple reasons. So, um, um, so I decided to do that, uh, which I thought, well, I mean, it didn't have the, uh, you know, the sales results that I expected, mostly because, well, actually, I'm not going to speculate as to why. Uh, I think that people have... Uh, um, Probably the, the social medias are not necessarily a, a, an ideal platform to promote music or to promote a cause. It's uh, they seem to be more a, a platform where people vent. Um, uh, but um, so it was a little bit disappointing on that end. But at least it gave me the um, well, it made me feel better about actually um, releasing the record because uh, at least I was doing something with the with the profits that I thought was a just cause. That's wonderful, man. So you were originally from France. You came to America when you were 21. Talk to me a little bit about growing up and how jazz became your life. It's, uh, it's a funny thing. You know, I had a, a strange upbringing. My dad had been a pianist uh, in his youth. Uh, he, he was uh, playing popular music uh, back in France, you know, doing... Uh, dances and stuff like that, but um, he he's from uh, he was born in twenty nine, so uh, obviously the music of the time was very much influenced by the jazz musicians uh, of that era. So he loved jazz, and um, he um, would play people you know such as Errol Garner and Oscar Peterson around the house all the time. And um, I wasn't exactly supposed to be a pianist, I suppose, because I was um, <clears throat> I was uh, born with uh, uh, with palsy in my left arm, so I was paralyzed for a year, and I was uh, so I grew up uh, kind of handicapped, and uh, and 
it uh, made me, uh, you know, practicing the piano wasn't fun because it hurt. And on top of that, I wasn't particularly keen on playing the music that they wanted me to play because back then in France, there was no such thing as modern music education. You basically played uh, Mendelssohn and Haydn and Mozart and that was it. And at the time, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really digging that music. And so playing piano hurt and I wasn't liking the music that I was playing. So it wasn't, um, uh, I didn't really think I was going to stick to it. And then um, once I heard a particular um, Harold Garner record, which is at the time was called The Magician, that record uh, just uh, made me jump with joy. And um, so I went to my piano teacher and I said, uh, I said, why can't we play this music? And, uh, and she said, um, uh, well, I can't teach you this because there's no music for this. It's improvised. And those were the, that's all I needed to hear. Uh, I thought, okay, well, then I'm going to be an improvising musician. Um, and, of course, I didn't, you know, uh, rationalize it um, in, in that way. I was probably six years old or something like that. But it made sense to me to try to emulate uh, those people whose uh, piano music really made me, just, just made me happy, and that's that's all I can say uh, about it. It just really thrilled me the same way some of the music of of that era, you know, my, the music of my con con contemporaries, um, was also um, fun to me. But the jazz thing had uh, basically planted its claws in me, and it wasn't letting go. Um, now the problem is that when you're, you know, when your left hand is Pretty much useless. Uh, at, you know, I was still young and and um, and uh, you know I had still a lot of growing up to do uh, in terms of mus you know muscles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, when you have heroes like uh, um, Errol Garner and Oscar Peterson, you you got a problem <laughs> because their left hand is certainly not uh, lacking. So. Uh, you know, I was doing my best, but I was uh, I was trying to pick up the the right hand stuff and understand the language, and um, it just uh, also happened that uh, my little hometown uh, in, in in France, which is called, which is called Andernos, uh, at the time it's, it's a little fishing town, you know, but um, at the time there was um, a, a fairly major jazz festival. Uh, every summer, and so I saw uh, people like um, Duke Ellington and uh, um, Arnett Cobb and uh, uh, Bill Coleman and um, people like that. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald. I, I saw these guys live actually as a kid, um, and that kind of confirmed my love for the music. The, there's a, an organist named Milt Buckner. Uh, who was supposed to do a set with, uh, I believe it was, uh, I think he was playing with Arnett Cobb at the time. And he was the only one there. The, the other guys were detained somewhere and then the bus broke down or something like that. So they were uh, over an hour late and uh, uh, Milt Buckner got up on stage to kind of... Uh, keep the crowd from going crazy and he sat at the piano and played about 45 minutes of stride and boogie woogie stuff and I was just in heaven um, and those are the early memories you know that, that kind of uh, set the stage for me to uh, want to be one of those guys um, And uh, but I didn't play jazz my whole life you know I was <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a child of the 60s so I was my first band was a punk a punk band. You know, I was playing uh, organ in a punk band and singing, uh, well, if, you, if you want to call that singing. Uh, and from, from there, I kind of moved on to prog rock and, and you know, we were doing original music and um, the music evolved. And from prog rock to jazz rock, you know, people like Santana were 
were bands that I really dug. And then one day I found some old, uh, you know what the, these eight track cassettes are? The, the, uh, are you old enough to know what, what those are? The, these, uh, they were like kind of like superior to cassette tapes. You could actually have, uh, you could move from track to track with the, the flick of a button. I found, while I was re rehearsing with my rock band, I found uh, some old uh, tapes of that sort in, in our garage. And um, I put one on, and it was uh, Oscar Peterson playing the American songbook. And I, I think I was 15 or 16 at the time. It just turns out that this, I hadn't heard this in a while, but my, you know, I had heard it a lot as a child. And he was playing, uh, Something's Coming. His arrangement of, uh, Something's Coming from West Side Story. We, we're listening to this with our friends. When he starts soloing, I start singing his solo. And my friends are looking at me, he's like, how do you know this? And I said, I have no idea. I actually had no idea, but it had made such an impact on me that the language was already starting to uh, come back out as soon as it was kind of, you know, triggered like this. So uh, so that's when I, I, I moved on to uh, to uh, trying to be, a, you know, an, an actual jazz musician. And I, I found some people in, uh, by then I was living in Bordeaux, which is the, which was the closest uh, big town to my village. And I found some people who uh, also play jazz, and I started getting some tips, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, long story short, uh, in, two, in 1982, uh, Miles Davis was in town, and his musicians, after the gig, came to a club. They were just hanging out, and we got up on stage to play, and his musicians joined us uh, uh, Tom Barney, Bill Evans, the sax player, Mino Cinello, and uh, we jammed, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. And um, they, afterwards, we were hanging out, and they said, hey, you know, uh, you sound all right. Maybe you should check out uh, Berkeley College of Music. I had never heard of Berkeley College of Music, but in my head, that meant, well, if they're saying that, I should check it out. And a year later, I was at Berkeley. Well, you know, the one thing that's interesting about what's going on in the world is that this last year has really put a pause on things, and it's made people be reflective about their lives. What mm -hmm. have you realized is that you like the best about being a musician over this year that's been relatively quiet? I never feel alone. I never feel lonely. I never feel... Because so much of my life is inner life. It never feels like I'm really that affected personally. Of course, I'm moved and touched by everything that's going on in the world. But um, it's not like my life's based around social interaction or, you know, it's, it's actually a lonely job to be a musician. You spend a lot of time with yourself trying to contemplate how you're going to uh, make yourself a, you know, a more creative person. So... Um, that has only reinforced that feeling, in in a sense, you know. It's also not just the pandemic. Uh, of course, by, by I, I stopped touring in 2009. Through the line, I had done 25 years on the road, and by then I had I had been teaching at Berkeley for a minute, and uh, I realized that I was done. Um, by the time all these uh, all this nonsense hit us. Um, I was not relying on touring and gigging to make a living. I was, uh, I had made um, teaching the number one, uh, you know, occupation in in, in my life, um, and so I was not affected in the way so many of my friends were affected. Uh, neither personally nor financially because Berkeley stayed open. I'm full-time there. Uh, I have a, a very good position. Um, I get to do a lot of uh, what I want to do. I teach what I want to teach. Um, I kind of have a niche position. Uh, it's not unique to uh, unique at Berkeley. A lot of people enjoy that. 
uh, Berkeley kind of gives you the uh, the opportunity to uh, do your own thing so that if if students want to seek you out particularly, you know, precisely, then they can do that. I was very lucky. I was very lucky. And I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who uh, was an amazing musician and uh, had just applied for a job at the post office. So if anything, this made me uh, realize how fortunate I have been um, it's not just luck. I've gotten some good advice over the years, and I was able to set myself up to make some, you know, some wise choices at different points in my life. Um, but um, not a day goes by when I don't think about my friends, and I don't realize how much better I have it than so many, so many of my very talented musician friends. The other thing I want to ask you is mm -hmm. once COVID ends and we get to the stage and we get back to the crowd, what do you hope that both the musician and the audience realizes about this time away from music? Well, I mean, the obvious thing is that I hope they realize how much they've been missing it. I really miss um, being uh, on stage. Uh, like I said, you know, I quit touring in 2009 and, and uh, um, people ask me, how can you do that? Well, I mean, it's, uh, I really miss being on stage. I really miss interacting with audiences and creating in the moment uh, for an audience. I haven't stopped creating in the moment. I still play a lot, at least until the pandemic hit, but, you know, I was still playing a lot. Uh, but I pick and choose uh, how and in what circumstance I want to play. But um, but uh, I think that when people ask me, you know, how I can actually, I, I could actually stop touring, uh, I do miss being on stage. What I don't miss is the 23 hours on either side of the concert. You know, the hours on the bus, the airports, um, the bad food, the uh, <laughs> the time away from home, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we we will go back to some kind of normal at some point. I'm not sure if it'll be the same kind of normal. I think what has just happened is just going to put a, a permanent stamp on on everything. I don't know in what way exactly, but I do hope that people after watching so many videos of things, how, how things are done, et cetera, et cetera, I, I hope there could even be a, uh, a return to uh, people checking out types of music that they weren't necessarily seeking out simply because, you know, the way jazz is absolutely unique is in the way that you can go hear a band and check, you know, you can hear a band seven nights in a row, hear the same tune seven nights in a row, and it'll never be the same thing. And that is kind of unique. Um, and hopefully this is uh, that, that feeling of being in the moment and appreciating the moment is something that people can find in not just jazz, any form of improvised music, but jazz being kind of the the apex of uh, improvisation, uh, improvised music, at least in my opinion. <clears throat> Hopefully there will be a, a return of interest or a, actually a, a heightened interest in what this brings to people's lives. I totally agree. So everything's going to come down to this. Everyone has a perception of you, an interpretation of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans. But you're the one living your life. Who do you think you are? <laughs> this is going to sound like a cliche, but I'm still trying to figure this out. Um, I know who I am as a person, uh, although that changes too because I'm growing. Uh, I don't think we ever stop growing. As a musician, what has um, changed uh, and probably changes daily is the fact that I, I feel like the 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 music that made me want to be a musician 
And there were many genres of music that made me want to be a musician. But if you go back to that moment when, when you know, things just really hit you. When I think about this, I realize that there is, there is a reason why I ended up where I am. It's not just because I love jazz or because I, I really had to go to Berkeley, uh, <clears throat> but it is because fundamentally the music that made me who I am is quint- quintessential Black American music. And uh, it's music that is at every every era, every uh, every step of the prog- progress, every great innovator is basically coming from coming out of the Black American experience. This is something that I remind myself and that I'm reminded of every uh, day because when I have to teach, um, you know, I teach amazing musicians, wonderful musicians, and I never stop to remind them that no matter who they're into, maybe they're into, you know, Eastern European jazz or Scandinavian jazz or, you know, Middle Eastern jazz, whatever they're into, um, none of this would exist without um, the contribution at, uh, of... Um, of black American musicians, that's one thing that I'll never, I'll never master. Uh, um, I'll never be done with it. I mean, I, uh, I'll go to my dying bed, assuming that it's a bed, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll go to my dying place, um, still trying to understand more about the blues. And every time, every time I think I know something about it, I hear somebody who reminds me that I'm not even close. And that's actually a wonderful feeling because I know I'm in the right place. Um, and I know that people can keep me in check here and they can keep me on my toes. And, um, this is why, um, my, Daily experience uh, is an ever-growing one, and I um, I feel good about this. You know about um, still having uh, some place to go. I mean, I wouldn't want to be Stephen Stephen Curry or LeBron James, you know, <laughs> because when you've mastered and and excelled in your art. And then it's, you know, really tied to some kind of uh, physical competence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it must be hard to know that that's it. You, you, you're already as good as you're going to get. I don't feel that way. Yeah, without a doubt. That's a great answer. Hey, Matt, thank you for taking some time out from Neon Jazz today. Good luck with everything that comes forward in 2021, and I appreciate it. I certainly appreciate being uh being asked to be a part of it and i wish you good luck with the program thanks for listening and tuning in to another neon jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in france boston kansas city and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz if you want to hear more interviews go to famous interviews with joe domino in the itunes store visit neon jazz at youtube.com and for everything neon jazz all the time go to the neon jazz.blogspot.com until next time enjoy the jazz my friends Neon Jazz.